Let's start with the same question for each of you. And that would be to think about Dean Smith, either as a coach or the person who used his, his, sec, uh, his uh, the way he uh, set up basketball, the basketball coach that he was, the good one, was to open other doors for other people. And then we'll let these folks, just in a short way, explain that before we get into some more questions. So Mike Cook, tell us about thinking Dean Smith. Uh, when I think about Coach Smith, I think about his relationship after you played for him, more so than when you played for him, because when you played for him, was, you, you're in a system, you're X's and O's, and he's play, you're playing defense all the time, basically, Woody. And, uh, but afterwards, he really took a great interest in each of us, no matter whether you're the first guy on the team or, or an All-American or just an average dude. And uh, he kept in touch with us. He wrote us letters. If we ever had a question we needed to answer, he would be the second phone call I would have. My first would be my father. Coach Smith would be my second phone call. And he was just great forever. I mean, for 40, 50 years, he kept in touch with us. Richard, how about you? We'll all say a lot of the same things on this, I suspect. Uh, I'm a Republican. Coach Smith was a Democrat. Uh, but in the way he loved his players, he was a Democrat. He believed everybody was equal. And it could be the best player who ever played for him for a long time or the worst player. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, treated, he treated us all as if we were somebody very special. I, 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 uh, yield to nobody in my devotion to that man. There was never a better human being in my life than uh, Coach Dean Smith. Jim Delaney. You know, a very remarkable man. Um, we were all 18 when we came here. Um, with the exception of Phil, I, I think we were all freshmen and eligible. Phil was maybe the best point guard in the country as a freshman, so we needed, there should be an exception for you, Phil, on freshman eligibility. <laughs> <laughs> but. The unique thing that, that I took away, and I didn't realize it sort of at the time, was that small things make big differences in life and in your preparation and how you treat people and how you build something. And um, we were always prepared because he had the big picture in mind, but he got there by making sure that uh, the details, the planning was understood and the execution was just always amazing, whether the players were the best players in the country or uh, just other players. We, we, we learned to execute, and he was a great teacher in that respect. Phil? Uh, since Coach Smith's death has been kind of amazing to me, um, when he was alive, we really didn't celebrate his contributions to, to mankind as I think as much as we should. And now, you know, don't get me wrong, we're, st we're saying some great things about Coach, and, and he deserves all of those great things. But let's not forget, he's the greatest coach to ever coach basketball, too, you know? <laughs> and in his death, it seems like we're kind of forgetting a little bit about what a great coach he was. And, and the last thing, and these guys can attest to this, you know, everybody, you kind of get in the picture of him being, you know, mild and really sweet. <laughs> you, ever, you never went to one of his practices, I'm telling you. So, to me, his practices, the practices were actually harder than the games to me. I don't know about you guys, but uh, you know, he's a great man. And uh, like I said, we we're celebrating what he did, not only on the basketball court, but what he did off the basketball court. But while we're doing that, let's not forget, you know, to me and to a lot of other people, uh, his innovations and his game. Uh, the way he changed things throughout the game, the way that he could look at, a, at another team and scout another team. I think the, what makes a really good coach to me is when you can take the team that you have. And everybody says that North Carolina has a system. We, we didn't really have a system. We had a philosophy because a system didn't really doesn't really change or deviate. The players we had changed. Now, we always knew that we were going to play together. We were going to play smart. We were going to play far, hard, and we wanted to have fun. But depending on the talent that we had, Coach Smith would come up with plays for us to run offensively and, and principles for us to use defensively depending on the talent of each individual player to put together and give us a chance to win every game. And I don't think there's ever been a per person better 
to do that, and I don't think there ever will be. Thanks. Reverend Seymour. If you looked at your bio of my name, you will notice that I confess that I graduated from Duke University. <laughs> I want you to know that that was not a choice. <laughs> I was in the Navy wearing a uniform, and the Navy ordered me to go to Duke. <laughs> I knew Dean primarily as a personal friend and not as a coach. It will tell you something about his priorities in that I was one of the first persons in Chapel Hill to get to know him because one of the first things he did was to find a church for himself and his family. I have known Dean Smith for 55 years and I had the pleasure of being his pastor for almost 30 years. The thing that really comes to mind when I think of Dean is his remarkable gift to relate to everybody, black, white, poor, rich, Democrat, Republican, adult, <laughs> child. He wanted everybody to be able to fulfill their potential and he related to every person in an equitable way. He was, had an extraordinary skill in his personal relationships. Thank you, sir. Freddie? For those of you who are sitting there wondering who the heck I am, <laughs> there's six musically speaking operas here, and I am the Looney Tunes portion of your program. <laughs> I kept stats for Coach Smith for five seasons from 1974 through the 1978 seasons. I was privileged to be a part of Phil's career. I saw him not as a player, but as a member of his staff. What he did, what he influenced, his creative mind was beyond belief, and we'll get into a little bit later. But one very quick anecdote that shows where he was, even as a great basketball coach, not only a great man and a great human being, but a great father. On the very day that Coach Smith was to go for the record to pass Adolph Rupp in Winston-Salem that many of you do remember in March, I was standing and working for CBS at the tunnel where Coach Smith came in, and of course the cameras caught him immediately. He saw me, he stopped while Andrea Joyce was trying to get an interview, and the first thing out of his mouth was to point out that his daughter, Kristen, had her AP U.S. history book and was currently a member of my U.S. AP class at Chapel Hill High School. <laughs> the record wasn't even there. <laughs> Ah, Fred, nah, she's got her book. I mean, it's okay, Coach. I think you got something else on your mind. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful man, and we will extol those stories, and I'm sure share more anecdotes that I think you'll find interesting. Thank you, Freddie. You want to hear from these people, and I will only leave one thing with you, and it was rather interesting to me. As a matter of fact, I found it very surprising. I was in his office one day and we were talking and it came up about winning and Coach Smith told me then that he had never talked to any of his Carolina teams about winning. He said, Woody, it's most important to remember the process and not worry about the result. The result will take care of itself. And that's how he molded the team except for one game the Montreal Olympics in 1976. After what happened overseas, we had to get that gold medal back. And he made sure that the, the team understood that, and they did win the gold medal and bring it back to the United States from the 76 Olympics. Okay. <laughs> Mike, you were in the transition period. What was that like? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, well, first of all, I was recruited by Frank McGuire, Coach McGuire, and um, his last recruiting class, actually. And he had incredible charisma. You know, he was the 
world's best dressed guy. If you were, let's put it this way, if you're going to a car dealership, the guy out there with the super suit on, the slick hair, big gift for Gab selling you the car would be Coach McGuire. Then when you went back into the office to find out what it was going to cost you, that would be Coach Smith. So <laughs> it was like going from, it was going from Barnum and Bailey to IBM. Uh, Coach McGuire's idea of practice was to choose up sides, throw the ball, roll the ball on the court, and let them play till somebody, while whoever's standing last wins. And uh, Coach Smith's idea of practice was everything's on time. We're going to do eight minutes here, 12 minutes there. We're going to play defense for 89% of the whatever the allotted time for practice was, and then we'll shoot a little bit and shoot some foul shots. And everything was, was on time, exact, and it was just, it was IBM. Richard, you had an interesting situation with your after college life. Well, I had a couple of things happen to me uh, <laughs> on the way to life. Uh, one of the things that happened to me that was shows Coach Smith, and I mentioned the Republican Democrat. I, I was running for governor in 2000, and I got a phone call from Coach Smith saying, Richard, can I help you? And uh, I said, Coach, uh, you're going to help me. I'm a Republican. I know where you are on the spectrum. He said, yeah, but I'd like to help you if I can. And we, in fact, did TV ads all over the state of Coach Smith, never saying I was a great player. He would tell the truth. He wouldn't <laughs> tell the truth. And he would never say he liked my philosophy, because I don't think he did. But he would talk about me and say that I had good character or something like that, whatever he could say honestly that he thought was OK. Uh, the other thing I would tell you about Coach Smith is when I was graduating from school here in law school, I was talking to Phil about that a minute ago, uh, I was, I'm 6'7", I was too tall to be drafted, but I felt in that, in that day, as you, some of you know, because you're my age, I see a lot of men my age, not many women. Uh, I, I was, I was uh, not subject to the draft, but the Vietnam War was going on, and I felt terribly guilty about uh, not serving and not having to serve. And, I started talking to him because he himself had been a military veteran, and I told him, Coach, I, I've got to solve this. And he said, well, why don't you join the reserves? And so I did. And when I went to the reserves, all the guys there were bragging about ducking the draft, and I couldn't deal with that. So I ultimately volunteered and served in Vietnam for a year. I got a letter every week from Coach Smith. I got a letter every two or three weeks from my wife. <laughs> He, 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 I don't believe I'd have said that. He, <laughs> but, but, but Coach Smith and my mom uh, were so concerned about my well-being, and you would have thought I was, as I said, a great player. I mean, I was a player that Phil Ford broke my scoring record when he scored his first basket. <laughs> uh, but to hear Coach Smith talk about me and to hear Coach Smith take care of me and worry about me was as if I was one of his great players. I was one of his friends, and that's what I'm most proud of. Jim? You know, um, I was sort of maybe closer to Richard and Mike than to Phil. So I got in a little bit, but um, um, so I was sort of, sort of with labor at the end of the bench and sometimes with management in the game. And so I, I knew the guys on the team pretty well um, and had good, good relationships. But you know, there just weren't enough minutes. We, we had a lot of good players. I think I played with eight or nine guys who played in the ABA or the NBA. We had very good teams, and they wouldn't have been any better if I was playing a lot. Um, and, and so everybody was really fighting for playing time. And as Phil said, you know, if you weren't unselfish and if you didn't play hard, you didn't have a chance anyway. But you're just trying to be part of the team. And, and he had to make difficult decisions about who played and who didn't play. And sometimes, if you wanted to play and didn't, there was a lot of frustration with that. And I, as a young person, because remember, we're 18, 19, 20 years old. And um, he, he and, and uh, Coach Guthridge, um, I thought, had a, um, gave a lot of space uh, to young people um, because you would, um, you would play out your frustrations in, in one form or another, um, and maybe we do things that you shouldn't do, 
Um, and yeah, he would discipline you, but you know, there was always a second chance. You know, he did not, you know, uh, throw people away. He sort of understood um, the people, uh, whether they were from, you know, the best players or the players in the middle uh, or play the players who weren't playing a lot. He understood the players, and, and I think that obviously he followed all of us through our lives with our children and in some cases grandchildren. He had a great memory and a, and a, and a great habit of, of keeping in contact and communication. But I just remember, you know, doing things, saying things um, that you could have closed the book and moved on. And he didn't do that. He, you know, he really um, did care. And I, I would, my dad was a teacher and a coach. And I would uh, say to my dad, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna move on. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, well, he said, you know, I sat in the living room when Coach Smith came up with a, um, with a letter of intent. And he promised two things. And um, no more than that. He said, one, he would make sure you had an opportunity for a good education. And two, you had an opportunity to compete to play. And you've had both. So what are you, where are you going? <laughs> Just stop it. <laughs> you know, so that's back in the day when, you know, your parents supported the coach or the teacher. And he was the teacher. And he stayed in contact. And he gave second chances. And young people need second chances. But they also need to be told the truth. And they need to have someone who really cares. And I really thought that, um, you know, his legacy, you know, and I know Phil says he's a great coach. He probably is one of the great coaches of all time, and he's won championships. But the two things that stood out, you know, when you really got away and thought about him was, one, the intergenerational community, family that he created. And, you know, we all feel so lucky to be part of that. And the other thing was, you know, when he took his stand, you know, in town, on the issues he took his stand on, he wasn't a Hall of Fame coach at the time. He hadn't been to the Final Four. In fact, he was closer to being hung in effigy than he was to being in any Final Four. So to do that as a new guy in town at 32 years old, following Frank McGuire when they're on pole, I mean, that is courage. That's not knowing the outcome of what's going to happen and doing the right thing. And I think, you know, as great a coach as he was and as many as great players as he had and his legacy, it, to, to me, it's the building of that large group, interconnected people, and then also the, the courage to act on his convictions before he had any power himself. But that was special. Well, wait till you hear what he told Phil Ford when he went to visit him in Rocky Mount. <laughs> well, you know, my mom, my mom and dad were teachers. Uh, Freddie and I were just talking. My dad was a history teacher, and his favorite period of time was the Civil War. And, Freddie is a Civil War buff. In Rocky Mount growing up, anytime something came on television about the Civil War, my family kind of, we kind of eased out of the den because we knew a, a lecture was going to follow pretty soon. Yeah, so. But uh, <clears throat> my mom was French and English, probably saw me play maybe five times uh, throughout the course of my career. Not here from seventh grade through eight years of professional basketball, five times in person, wasn't a big sports fan. You know, she thought Dean Smith was the dean of a school here in North Carolina. <laughs> <coughs> so, you know, coach comes to Rocky Mount to recruit me, and the, uh, the, the first 30, 40 minutes of the conversation, we talked about being a good student, uh, race relations, being a good citizen, just, Different things, you know, so basketball. When we finally got into basketball, <clears throat> Coach Smith was honest. You know, he said that he couldn't promise me any playing time. He didn't know where I would fit in. Uh, we're one of the very few teams that have a JV program. I may have to play JV some. And, you know, when Coach Smith told me that, I grew up a Carolina fan, but Carolina kind of went down to the bottom <laughs> of the list right there. So, <clears throat> but uh, he was honest. And uh, when he left, uh, I, always remember this like it was yesterday. Uh, my mom came in my room and sat down on my bed, something she never did, <laughs> and uh, told me that she thought that we could trust Coach Smith. And I'm going, Where, where's, where's all this coming from? And you know, she said, you know, she didn't know a lot about sports. Like, I mean, she just thought we could trust Coach Smith because 
She said that it was obvious that he wanted me to play basketball at North Carolina. He wouldn't have come to Rocky Mount to visit you. And she said, the other coaches are coming in here from the other schools telling you how much you're going to play, and how much that you'll even start. But you've had some success as a high school player. You know, they don't know what kind of player you're going to be as a college player. And she, lastly, she said, uh, if you go to North Carolina and play JV, your freshman year, there's probably a reason you're playing JV. You know, coach wants you to get better. And if you work hard your sophomore year and work a little harder your junior year, if there's an opportunity for you to start when you're a senior, <laughs> this is true. I mean, she went through this. She said, if it's an opportunity for you to start when you're a senior, he won't be out promising your starting position to another high school All-America. And you know how sometimes your mom, she, she, they just kind of kiss you and kind of skip out of your room. Kind of pissed me off, you know what I mean? Because she, she, she was right, you know, one of those things. Phil Jr. and then kind of skip out of the room a little bit. But uh, yeah, as it turns out, you know, the relationship that I had with Coach throughout the years uh, was strictly that. He was always honest. And as Jim said, I think the family that he built throughout the 36 years here is just something that will never be done again. And the reason I think that um, he was able to build that family was the relationship that he had with us, all of us thinking that we were treated fairly. Everything didn't always go the way we wanted it to go, of course, but it was fair. Um, I don't think that when I was a freshman, I had to carry the projector, you know, I mean, when I was a sophomore All-America, I'm sitting in the back, and Bruce Buckley, who never played, sitting in first class, you know. <laughs> it was hard for me to understand then, but the older I got, it kicked in, you know, so. <laughs> but, um, you know, what, what, a, what a fantastic person. And another thing, I think we all grew. Uh, number one, you know, you hear people talk about, and it really upsets me that Coach Smith should have won so many different titles and stuff, but you have to look at, they're looking at finished products. You know, I, I, I think from my senior year in high school to my senior year in college, I was 20 times better as a basketball player. And that's everybody that comes here. You know, you can't look at the finished product and put the finished products together. You know, you have Al Wood playing with a freshman James Worthy or James Worthy playing with a freshman Michael Jordan. Now, when you start talking about Michael, that's a little different breed of animal <laughs> right there. But so you can't really use him. But you see the point I'm trying to make is, you know, everybody got better, much better here as a basketball player. And everybody grew as a person, grew as an individual. You know, our eyes were open to things that coach didn't really force on us, but the seed was planted there for us to at least think about. And, you know, I know it's something now. Like, my family hates going to the airport with me because Coach Smith has scarred me for life. I just can't be late. I'm always, I mean, I, I'm at the airport 30 minutes, an hour, to when I'm supposed to be early, you know, so. But uh, it's all good things. And um, I'm just, uh, as I tell people now that he's gone, I think uh, I was honored to have played for him, but I was blessed to see the way that he lived. Bob, in his book, A Coach's Life, he talks about the fact that the day he was named head coach publicly, that you called him on the telephone about some things you thought he needed to do from that position as the head coach. Would you share that with us? One of the most revered chancellors of the university was Dr. Frank Graham. And he once compared the university in Chapel Hill to a lighthouse. He said, Chapel Hill is, is like a lighthouse. It sends its bright beam into the distant darkness. And like a lighthouse, Chapel Hill is also dark at its base. In the 60s, the time when Dean Smith arrived in this community, Chapel Hill was a segregated, conservative place. 
And it was very difficult for people to speak out on controversial issues. Dean realized that this could not last. He realized that the time had come for a major change in this sleepy southern town. And in the 60s, Chapel Hill was in turmoil and controversy. And Dean was one who was seeking to push us in the right direction. <laughs> and if you've read any of the things about Dean's life, you probably know two things when the two of us were involved. <clears throat> we thought we could get a public accommodations law passed in Chapel Hill before we were forced to do it by the federal government. And we failed. We failed. We didn't have enough votes or power to get that done in this so-called liberal town. So our church, after the law was finally passed, decided we would put to test all of the restaurants that had said we will never change. And Dean and I and an African-American student were asked to go to the Pines restaurant. Some of you are old enough to know what a wonderful restaurant that was. It was a prestigious restaurant in Chapel Hill. Indeed, it was the place where all of you probably have eaten meals. We got meals the basketball team was taken to the Pines for regular feasts, but it was a place where only white people were welcome. He wanted to change that. And he and I and an African-American student went to dinner. And when the management looked out and saw who it was, they knew on which side their bread was buttered. <laughs> and they opened the door, and we were served graciously. And the other restaurants in Chapel Hill followed suit. The other illustration that you probably read about is Dean wanted very much to be able to recruit African-American players. We challenged him. He was chair of our student affairs committee. We said, Dean, we want you to accept as your assignment from this church to go out and find the most able, talented African-American student. We didn't call him African-American in those days. We said he was black or Negro. Go find the best one and recruit him for your team. And then Dean did that. And as you know, the time has almost come when we need to go out and recruit some white players. <laughs> Bob, Bob. Richard, Richard has something he wants to ask you or comment. I know that uh, Pud Hassel and Bill Brown are here, but Mike and I are here. We're for the reasons he was hung in effigy. I don't think he wanted more of that. <laughs> well, which leads me to say that Dean was a man of strong conviction and courage. I don't know many coaches who would have run the risk of alienating their fans by taking some of the positions that he took. Dean was very vocal in being against the death penalty. We've been blessed by eight years with a de facto moratorium on the death penalty. And Dean's voice would be one of the loudest to say, it's time we got rid of the death penalty in North Carolina. Nebraska just did it, why can't we do it? Dean also was very vocal about nuclear weapons and the abolition of nuclear weapons. He was always concerned about civil rights issues. And here we are, 50 years away from the original civil rights laws, and we've got people all across this country trying to find ways to keep black people from voting. 50 years have passed. And I would also like to say, 
Dean believed that every person was special and God's child, no matter the, what their sexual identity might be. And I am confident that he will be standing with us today, hoping and praying that the Supreme Court would pass the ruling accepting gay marriage. Freddie, you're up next, and before we hear from you, uh, let me say that most of you, I think, or a good many of you at least, have seen that terrific video that, uh, that Freddie did some time ago extolling Coach Smith and so forth, but now the latter part of it, correct, has been re-edited, and uh, he will uh, put that on for us when we finish up the evening. Freddie, anything now? As to the video or just as to statistics? Just into st st statistics. Statistics. I haven't worked a game in so long I can't say it anymore. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I was not recruited um, to keep statistics, but I came to the University of North Carolina and was a fan and enamored and in awe being around Coach Smith. My avenue into the Carolina basketball program came by way of intramurals. I lived in Teague dorm. We lived and breathed intramurals. And I got to know Dr. Ronald Hyatt, many of you may remember Coach Hyatt, who embraced and took me into the intramural program. I was an intramural official, and that led to the opportunity to be an apprentice for supervisor of intramural officials. And I worked with a very intense individual who was teaching me what to do, a guy by the name of Roy Williams. <laughs> From that position, I was able to get a statistician role with Coach Smith. I didn't keep just shots and loose ball recoveries and assist. Every time this guy made an assist, of course we got that, but Coach Smith also wanted to make certain that even if the person that received Phil's pass, if he didn't score the bucket and therefore is not an NCAA assist, Coach Smith wanted to know, which got to be the Phil Ford assists. Bobbled it and got it back. It was a turnover. Exactly. <laughs> Now. Hey, look, folks, I kept statistics for a, a, with ESPN and a lot of folks. I watched Bobby Hurley get a, an assist when he was chasing the national record when he was on the bench <laughs> over at Duke. <laughs> I looked at the official score and I went, what? <laughs> yeah, well, it was close. I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, one other stat sheet that I kept that just showed Coach Smith's incredible creativity. He was a mathematician. For two solid seasons, I got called to his office previous to those two seasons. And he asked me, would I keep a statistical chart that charted the officials? Every whistle, he wanted to know the time on the clock, the score, which official made the call by name, what the call was, and a reaction. I averaged 95 to 100 entries per game. I kept it for two full seasons, and during that time, he just wanted to know that whoever walked in the door with the striped shirts, perhaps there might be a trend. More charges as opposed to blocks, more fouls called in the paint as opposed to letting them play pretty freely. He would sit and watch game film after the, after the game and grade everyone. Then he'd take my sheets, which looked like chicken scratch or Egyptian hieroglyphics, figure out what I had written and watch an entire game a second time going with the officials and my notes. After two complete seasons, he came to me and he said, Fred, thank you so much. And he gave the officials the greatest compliment they could receive. Nothing. But he was willing to invest two full seasons to just see if there might. And in fact, on one game he got a technical, not 
for cursing, which he never did, or getting after an official, but because he reminded the official that he was 10 and 16 when he called the games against him. <laughs> I'm 10 and 16 when you referee. <laughs> and he got rung up for that one. <laughs> so I'll take the unintentional assist in that respect. Very good. Thanks, Freddie. Thank I know that I know that most of you have read in your papers or you've heard on the radio and television and so forth about what has transpired since Coach's passing. And a couple of things, most of them, uh, one of the things was the Letterman all getting $200 checks to go out and have a nice dinner with their wife or their girlfriend or whatever. And the next one was the scholarships that have been established for needy students at Carolina. So I'm just going to let these guys right along here. Mike, Richard, Jim. You're filled, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and let, let this group just talk about what that meant to them when they got the envelopes and opened it up and saw what it was and what it was for. I'll, I'll start. Um, I was surprised but not shocked. Um, several years ago, 10 years ago actually, uh, I was interviewed for this book. Kilgo wrote with Coach Smith called The Carolina Way. And I was quoted several times in the book because they were interested in the transition from McGuire to Smith, etc. And um, I got a, a letter in the mail. This is 2004. I'd been out of school 40 years. Thanking me for participating in the book and being part of the book. And it goes on and on and on. Typical Coach Smith. And he sent a $100 check for being part of his book. So I said, Coach, I, I called him on the phone. I said, Coach, I don't really want this check. I, I, I just quoted it a couple of times here. He said, Mike, I want you to take Jackie, who's my wife. You take Jackie out to dinner with $100, which I guess today would be $200. Uh, and if you don't, it's an insult to me. So when the $200 check came, I told Jackie, I said, Jackie, I'm going to frame this check. She said, I don't think, I think Coach Smith would want you to take me to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so I started thinking about it and I remember this, this conversation I had with him about the $100 check. So this is, that was not the first time he'd done something like this, and I'm sure he's done it to everybody who's involved that qu was quoted in, in his books. But so it was a surprise, but not a shock, and it's just, Coach Smith just keeps on giving even though he's gone. I, uh, I, I knew I didn't deserve that check. Uh, <laughs> you, you just don't pay $200 for one point. So I, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, sent my check to Bob, I sent my check to Bob's church, and, and Judy's never been taken out to a meal for $200 anyway, so she wouldn't know how to behave. <laughs> The other, the other one to tell you, though, is the, how, how consistent this is. I, I got the privilege of being Coach Smith's lawyer for a number of years, and I actually helped him negotiate the last Nike contract that he signed before he retired, which was at that time the largest Nike contract given to any coach in any school in the country. It was $4 million plus. He gave every bit of that money away to this university, to other coaches, to other programs. He would not take a penny of it. I say that because I know there are coaches today being paid millions of dollars, and in those millions of dollars are the Nike or the Reebok or whatever the shoe contract is. That's Coach Smith's nature. He, he gave things away. He was simply not one to, to, to hoard things that he thought could be better used for other purposes. So Judy hates that I gave that check away, but Bob, I hope it's, <laughs> hope it's well used by the church. <laughs> Mike, I know you were in transition between Coach McGuire and Coach Smith, and it's probably why you only got 100 bucks. I got 200 for my quote. <laughs> I got to tell you one officiating story, because um, Coach Smith really did evaluate uh, officials. Um, and I, I, when I was in law school, I used to referee practice. and. Um, you know, he, he would always want, right? He would always want the white team to build confidence against the blue team, right? And and because he wanted to show show them that you could come from behind and use of timeouts. And 
you know, the guys in the blue team realize if they win, practice is never going to be over. <laughs> so if you dribble the ball off your foot, practice is over, white team gets the win, their confidence is good, and we all get to go home, so that's good. So he had recruited Robert McAdoo, and he was the first junior college, first transfer, I guess, mm -hmm. but he was coming in from Vincennes, and Robert was a great player, he was an MVP and leading scorer in the NBA, and took the team here to the Final Four. Well, Coach Smith, you know, back in the day, was always teaching the big guys verticality, right? He doesn't want you blocking shots. Well, Robert, you know, Robert McAdoo could go well above the top of the box and block shots, and, and so Coach Smith was trying to explain to him, you know, I want you to stand vertical with your arms raised, and I don't want any block shots. I want you to learn how to stand vertical down in the low post area. And he said to me, Jim, when he goes to block a shot, everything is goaltending. I mean everything. Every shot, he because McAdoo wants to block everything, and he can block everything. He's flying through the air. And so I said, Coach, I can't call. Those are good blocks. He says, everything is going to be called a goaltend until he learns to go vertical. <laughs> so, so I said, fine. So I'm calling everything a goaltend. And he, McAdoo's looking at me like, you know, A, I don't like him. B, I'm not a very good official. And, and he had no use for me. So 30, 40, 30 years later, we were back together for a reunion. I don't know if it was a 100-year reunion or, or what it was, but we're all back in town. And I went up and introduced myself, and I said, you know, Robert, I said, when you first came in in, in, in October um, of 71, I was in law school, and I was the official. He said, yeah, on the block shot, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he remembered it. I said, yeah, I said, I, I, he says, I know, he says, I know what was going on there. Yeah. <laughs> Phil? To, to add on to a story, funny story about Coach Smith when we, uh, since we were talking about it, one day we were in practice, and you guys remember Rashid, you know, and you talk about a guy gets a bad rap. He's the greatest teammate, loves this place more than, I mean, I'm, I'm glad he was on our team. But, you know, Rice is probably the most gifted, talented big guy. You know, he just do so many different things we've ever had. So Rashid comes down. We're on a fast break. They pitch ahead, and Rashid takes like a 20-foot jump shot, but no pass. Coach Smith blows the whistle and says, uh, hey, Rash, do you think that was a good shot? And we all know if Coach blew the whistle and asked you that question, usually you knew it was a bad shot. So you say it's a bad shot. So you took it out of the other team, got the ball, and went back. So Rashid says, yes, Coach, that was a good shot. And it kind of shocked Coach, and Coach said, well, do you think you can hit 10 in a row? And usually somebody would say, no, I can't hit 10 in a row. Rashi said, yeah, I can hit 10 in a row. <laughs> Coach, Coach Smith says, throw him the ball, sick up, throw him the ball, sick up, throw him the ball, sick up. It got up to around eight. Coach Smith said, it's still a bad shot. Take the ball out of it. <laughs> 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 Rosh was going to hit 10 of those, boy. I was dying. I wanted to laugh so much, man. That was so funny. But um, <laughs> Richard's, got, Richard's got one more. Uh, Timo Makinen was a big guy, a great guy. Apparently, Timo took a jump shot from about eight feet, and nobody was guarding him, and Coach got called timeout and called him over and said, Timo, that was a terrible shot. Why'd you take that? He said, well, Coach, nobody was guarding me. He said, Timo, why do you think they weren't guarding you? <laughs> One of the other things that you probably heard about, and I asked him when I called him to be with us today, if Dr. Seymour would tell you what he said that day of the memorial service about how we could honor Coach Smith today. Well, <coughs> um, today is a day of transition for thousands of young people in the Triangle who are graduating from this great institution and many others. I can think of no better way to honor Dean Smith than to believe, as I'm sure he believed, that never do you have to sacrifice academics to be successful in athletics. 
Never do you have to sacrifice academics to be successful in athletics. I think someone's always said that Dean was a teacher. He would call me sometimes. My phone would ring and I would pick it up and it would be Dean who said, Bob, I've got a practice this afternoon and I want to be able to give my boys some good advice. Can you give me a quotation from Martin Luther King? <laughs> and he might say something like, do right because it is right and not because you're afraid to do wrong. Some of you may not know that Dean Smith received the Arthur Ashe uh, Medal for Courage. And when Arthur Ashe's will asked him to accept this medal, he said, I'm not courageous, I'm just trying to do what's right. I don't deserve this medal, and he refused to accept it. They came back to him the next year and asked him to accept the medal, and I said, Dean, you should accept this. And he did. My wife and I happened to be in New York City, and this event by ESPN was in Radio City Music Hall. I was sitting next to Charlie Scott. Unbeknown to Dean, when you do there? When you do there? Well, unbeknown to Dean, ESPN had brought 12 of his outstanding players from teams. And as he was called to the platform to receive the Arthur Ashe Medal for Courage, there came from both sides of the stage six of his former players dressed in tuxedos. Some of you know that Dean hated to make a speech. He just didn't like to make a speech. But he did his best speaking when people were interacting with him, when they were asking questions. Well, he had practiced his speech, but when he saw these players coming from both sides of the stage, he forgot his speech. <laughs> he began thanking everybody from God on down. <laughs> it was a memorable evening. We've got a little less than uh, 30 minutes still to go here, but Freddie, how long will the video take? It'll take five. Take five? Okay. We promised the audience that we'd let them give us a question or two if anybody wants to do that and direct who the question should go to if you stand up and do that. Question? Yes, sir. Jim, you told me you didn't say what you did with your checks. <laughs> Jim, you didn't say what you did with your checks. <laughs> the mics? No, no. Um, I have my check. You know, we had a, I had a meeting with our basketball coaches last week. So I wanted to hold on to the letter and the check. And I passed it around the table so our coaches could see that. And they were all moved. You know, they were all moved by it. And um, so I took it back to my office and I had it color photo photocopied. So... Um, you know, I, I don't know what, I haven't cashed it yet, and um, um, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it yet. Uh, so it's to be determined. Next. I'm gonna go out, he, to he told me to, hello? <laughs> he told me to go out to dinner, so I'm going out to dinner. I did, <laughs> I did what he told me to do when he was alive, so. <laughs> Not going to change. <laughs> he, he, he can definitely see me now if I don't go out to dinner like he said, and he'll probably remind me of it if I don't do it. So I'm definitely going to go out to dinner on it. The, the, the South. I'd like to tell you a recent story about Dean Smith that happened while he was very, very sick. A member of our church who plays the guitar asked Linnea, his wife, just, what, is, what does Dean do? Is there anything he really likes? Does he enjoy music? 
And she said, yes, he likes to listen to music. And he said, well, I'm going to call you and I'm going to come out to your house and just bring my instrument with you and sing some songs. And um, I'll, I'll do that. And he did. After playing the songs for about 30 minutes, he said, I think I better go, but there's one song that I haven't played that I would like to play. Hawk, hawk the sound. <laughs> Immediately he had a flash of recognition and from his dementia stood up out of the wheelchair, put his hand on his chest and said, stand up everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and we can honor him by standing up and being willing to express our convictions that every person in this nation and in the world counts and we must get rid of this, what what's the mean. word, obscene inequity that we have in this country today. Freddie, maybe now is a good time for the video. Okay. This was written back here. We have a couple questions. Can we have a couple questions first? Okay. Who's got the questions? Back here. Back here. Oh, okay. If you go out to about the 50 yard line, I can see you there. <laughs> okay. uh, the South Carolina legislature just appropriated money for a jet plane for recruiting for Clemson University. They're buying it. What would Dean Smith think? <laughs> well, <laughs> let, let, let the commissioner of the Big Ten yeah. take on that one. <laughs> Last time I looked, Clemson was not in the Big Ten. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think he would do it. Lady. Yeah. Um, I, I, oh, that's okay. I, listen, I taught school for 25 <laughs> years. I ain't here. Um, We're thinking think. that Linnea probably has the medal. Yes, it has not been at this time uh, suggested or any type of activity to take it and place it in the basketball museum. So our guess is that it's probably with uh, with Coach Smith's uh, with his wife. Bless. We have a universe here. <clears throat> Any more? Please stand up if you have a question. Arms and against this backdrop, difficult to see. Yes, sir. I have a statement. I'm loud. I'm from Gastonia, and our newspaper did an article on Lee Deadman getting his check. And what he did was he added $200 to it and donated it to a middle school for food because his quote was, Dean Smith would want it played forward. Okay. 
Any other questions or statements? Okay, Freddie, I think we're ready. This was written originally for the basketball centennial. I was asked to do that and very flattered to be given the opportunity to write something hopefully special about a very special person. It was a task. I was asked to do something in five minutes and try to capture 36 seasons. Many of you have seen this. It does have some tweaks, but we hope you won't mind if just maybe once more you take a look at something that came from my heart about someone who lives within all of our hearts. We know you're not comfortable with that. You'd rather point to your players, but coach, they're an extension of you and first came because you saw something good in each, athletically, academically, personally, and the combined good created greatness. For 36 seasons professing we, not me, we marveled as you created teams from individuals, prepared players to be men, and sculpted this game into a work of art. Most of us saw only competition, but you, ever the teacher, saw beyond. You saw young men competing in a greater game, that of life. And there were other lessons. Early on, you made it clear that ability and character mattered most, not the color of one's skin. And with players black and white and Carolina blue, your teams played as one, unselfishly, and were rewarded with wild success. So much so that college basketball and Carolina basketball are one, synonymous. Our program nationally recognized for victory with honor, with ethic, with class. And through all the success, your constant humility. Demonstrated when we tried to name this arena, this show place that would never have been without you. And when Sports Illustrated deemed you worthy of their highest honor, though it probably made you feel uncomfortable we knew the attention was richly deserved, just like it was in Winston-Salem on a March day in 1997 when all of college basketball took notice of a milestone in the stands, a veritable who's who of former players who came from all points of the compass who wanted to share the day with you. At game's end, we delighted in the scene on the floor, current players ecstatic reveling round you, swimming in the historic moment, making sure the spotlight that day lingered on you, for you. And then there was the afternoon we honored the teams of 57 and 82. There you stood, shyly, at the end of a line of Carolina greats. Beside you, perhaps, the greatest. Then came the simple act, moving and powerful acknowledgement of you as a coach, as a father figure. There were more chills in 2008, in Charlotte, the ACC tournament, where you were named an ACC legend. Introduced, there was applause, and then something unexpected happened. The applause amplified into ovation. On and on it went, from fans that represented every school in the conference. Recognition from those who for four decades treasured any victory over a Dean Smith team. But on that day, all honored you as a treasure, showering you with the ultimate sign of respect, tribute from one's opponents. Coach Smith, they came to understand what we have long understood. You represent all that is good about sport. And who you are, what you stand for, are living embodiments of what the University of North Carolina is. And this university remembers an October day in 1997, a frozen moment. So momentous, we remember where we were, what we were doing, when we fumbled with the stunning news that an era had ended. It came so suddenly. We didn't get a chance to say thank you. Tonight, we will. 
We hope you'll forgive as we employ one of your many innovations. In this place that bears your name, while we celebrate your life, we pause and point to you for a lifelong assist. Thanking you, Coach, for more than victories, for loyalty to school and players, for making us understand that trophies are cherished mementos in time, but the values learned in winning them are timeless. And that is what you are, Coach. Timeless. Our priceless gem with radiant shine. And so gathered here, driven by the backbeat of the game we hold dear, we, Tar Heels past, present, and future, take this moment to say, with head, with heart, with all of our being, with pride, respect, and yes, love, thank you, Chris Smith. Thank you. so forth and let me thank the panelists for doing such an outstanding job in reflecting the memory of a man who was so special to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon.